Welcome to this very special 44th episode of SpaceX in the News. This is the number one place to be for all your latest SpaceX intel. My name is Kevin, and today we're going to start things off down in Boca Chica, Texas, with the current status of Starhopper's highly anticipated 200 meter flight. And I'll also be bringing you with me on last week's tours of the shipyard. Then we'll make our way to Coco to see Starship's progress, we'll talk about Mars a bit. Then we'll finish things up with today's honorable mention. I'm really excited for this one. You don't want to miss it. Let's get started. So here we are, another week has gone by and we're all still eagerly awaiting the FAA's approval of SpaceX's first Starship prototype to hop to 200 meters. Road closures that were made earlier in the week in anticipation for the next hop have since been canceled, but new ones have sprung up for August 26th through the 28th. And yes, a notum has been put into place as well. However, while that surely can't hurt expectations, a notum does not confirm these new dates. In fact, one was put into place for a prior test date that was ultimately canceled just like the others. So guard your hearts, my friends. Don't make yourselves vulnerable. Now, with that being said, I do wanna mention that I do make these SpaceX in the News episodes every Friday. It takes me like all day. And I release them obviously on Saturday mornings. So in that in-between time, it's very likely that new information is pushed out that just doesn't make it into my new episode. So to help compensate for that, I always put an addendum episode on my Patreon page by the end of the day on Saturdays. And that includes all the information I might've missed during that window. Starhopper's fate has been confirmed by the boss man himself. She will be converted into a test stand for future Raptor firings. Last weekend, I took a trip to Boca Chica to visit the SpaceX Starship shipyards before they turned Starhopper into a test stand. And unfortunately, the 200 meter hop was pushed as I was boarding my flight, but the trip was still a productive experience. I stayed on South Padre Island, which is just north of Boca Chica. I got to meet up with Lewis and his wife who run the Channel Lab Padre, extremely nice people. And they even took me up on the roof of a hotel we ate lunch at and showed me the Starship shipyard way off on the horizon. Lewis is so cool that he's even allowing me to stream their stream of Starhopper's upcoming 200 meter flight. So that's really awesome that we'll get to watch it together this time. And I'm telling you, if you have not subscribed to Lab Padre yet, you need to get on it. So I took the 45 minute drive to Boca from the island and seeing the Starship get closer and closer through my windshield was a very surreal experience. This is insane being here in person. Holy cow, it's a freaking spaceport, brah. I met up with locals Maria, Ray, Alex, and Austin who welcomed me with open arms. SpaceX had Starship's nose cone removed during the previous days, but were now in the process of putting it back on when I was there. We assumed they were trying to fix the pre-existing measurement blunder they had going on. However, now it was looking worse than before. But after hours of banging, cutting, and more banging, it seems as if the workers finally got the broken nose set into place. And although it was 100 degrees with 70% humidity, <laughs> Maria offered to take me on a tour around the SpaceX properties and even gave me some interesting behind the scenes information. So cool, this is a spaceport in Texas. It's like out of Star Trek or something. It's a, it's a rocket shipyard. Yeah, you can see on uh, the nose cone over there, there's some work being done. I saw some flamage going on. There it is. Intense. But what's new is this area that SpaceX has expanded into. And it looks like they are building three foundations. There's one that they're building. There's one and there's one. We're not sure what they're for yet, but maybe some sort of staging area for super heavy parts, maybe. Not sure. We will find out in the future. It's scary. So we're driving through, uh, what's this, Boca Chica Boca Village? Chica Village. All right. This is where all the local residents live. There's probably, what, like a couple dozen or a dozen people living here? Well, right now there's about six families here in the summer, and in the, it's full in the wintertime, the winter Texas. Right, that's right. This is uh, SpaceX's OSHA-required medical facility. Okay. Right So here. SpaceX owns this building. Yeah. They own about six buildings here now. Six buildings. That's a nice little panoramic there of Starship in the background. Focus camera. Here we go. Pretty cool. All right, so we are at SpaceX's site that houses the uh, the gases that they aren't currently using. You can see there's uh, some methane tanks right here. Back there is the Starship site, and then way past these tanks is where Star Hopper is. But what's interesting is that during the last Star Hopper flight, those wildfires that broke out actually made it to within a block of this site, which is a, uh, that's a pretty scary notion to think about. I also asked them some questions concerning their unique situation, being neighbors of a leading space company and all. What's up guys, I'm here with Austin Bernard and we are in front of Starship Mark One. And with me is Maria Pointer local resident as well as Alex Bandera. 
So, Austin, what's it like having SpaceX as a neighbor? Honestly, it's just it's mind-boggling to think that they're developing a craft that's going to go into space, just like right in our backyard. It just, it's it's so, so unreal. Um, I'm excited about the technology side of it. I love to, I'm a, not a geek, but I can spend four hours reading the stupidest thing online about the space technology or watching your <laughs> YouTubes, which aren't stupid. But... So if there's any SpaceX employees watching right now, what would you have to say to them? Honestly, just keep up the good work, but I have one, just one little critique. Y'all gotta give Starship a little nose job, guys. Come on. <laughs> Besides that, everything's perfectly fine. I love the work y'all are doing. Y'all inspiring millions. Okay, so the big question is, do you ever plan on going to Mars? And if so, do you want to go and visit or do you want to go there and live permanently? I'll just go there for a visit. Uh, it's a one-way trip. <laughs> I just want to survive. Honestly, I would, in a heartbeat, go to the moon. Oh, yeah? I, I'm a boom child from the Apollo program. And I would go to Mars and I live there permanently and hopefully help out and play a, my own role into helping create the, a new civilization or another world and hopefully inspire billions back on Earth to see if we can do it on Mars, maybe they can come to peace on Earth. That's a great answer. I would just say I want to be a janitor on Mars. But that's just my dream. Thank you, Austin Bernard. Um, if you guys want to get a hold of Austin, what's your Twitter handle, bro? Austin Bernard 45. Follow us on uh, SpaceX Boca Chica group. They're on Facebook, all right? And SpaceX Boca Chica. And uh, my Twitter is uh, Boca Chica Maria. Maria and Ray have been longtime fans of the channel, and I just want to say to them, thank you guys so much for the hospitality you showed me. And a very special thank you to my Patreon members who support this channel and allow me to go on trips like that. I also want to thank Southwest Airlines, SouthPadre.com, and La Copa Beach Hotel. If any of you ever decide to make the trip yourself, make sure you click on the description below and you can see some SpaceX discount offers. Before we move on to the Mark II prototype in Cocoa, Florida, I'll add that Elon has decided to push his Starship presentation to mid-September, stating that it will probably make more sense to do it when Mark I has three Raptors, moving body fins, and landing gear installed. Those moving body fins have already been spotted on site, but construction is progressing at the Cocoa site as well for Starship, and new interesting developments are happening. Those rings that are speculated to make up the Super Heavy booster have been moved to the heart of the assembly area, and now there are a lot more of them. Aerial footage taken by Seymour Holdings shows that the hangar is now fully tarred as well as more super heavy rings on the far side of the workshop. Mike DeForest and his local news team over at ClickOrlando.com did some superb investigative reporting concerning SpaceX's logistical plan to transport the massive rocket 20 miles to launch Complex 39A at the Cape. Starting at the Coco construction site, the spacecraft components will be towed through a field to Grissom Parkway. The spacecraft will then travel eastbound in the westbound lanes of State Road 528. Traffic in both directions will be blocked while the rocket is moved to this small island in the Indian River. Here, Starship will be rolled onto a barge. Documents obtained by News 6 show what that barge will look like, along with two tugboats to pull it. Once in the water, Starship will likely travel from the Indian River to the Banana River through the Canaveral Barge Canal, and then straight up to the Kennedy Space Center. Records show the spacecraft will be floated into this basin near the Vehicle Assembly Building and Launch Pad 39A. If you want to watch the full newscast, I put a link down in the description below. Elon's starting to have second thoughts about his aspirations to nuke Mars, tweeting, might make sense to have thousands of solar reflector satellites to warm Mars versus artificial suns, to be determined. Nuking Mars refers to a continuous stream of very low fallout nuclear fusion explosions above the atmosphere to create artificial suns. Much like our sun, this would not cause Mars to become radioactive. Asked when there would be any risks, he says not risky in his opinion and can be adjusted and improved in real time. Essentially need to figure out our most effective way to convert mass to energy as Mars is slightly too far from the solar system's fusion reactor, aka the sun. But if you're still on team nuclear annihilation, SpaceX's Nuke Mars t-shirts are now available, as well as our mine. Come on, last week you guys practically begged me to do it, so I'm giving it to you. Well, I mean, you still have to pay for it, but I promise you're not getting screwed. All right, I am super pumped for today's honorable mention, so let's do it. Oh! Yay! So Kerbal Space Program. I know many of you watching this have at least heard about it. Most of you have probably played it. Sure, it's a game at its core, but really it has the potential to be much more than that depending on how you decide to play. It's basically a flight simulator for rockets based on real physics. 
It allows you to design and build aerospace vehicles to take your Kerbinauts across the solar system, which is modeled very much like our own. You can even set up experiments and do science on other planets. You don't even have to be a gamer to enjoy KSP. In fact, I would make the bold claim that it's not a game for gamers, because most gamers tend to be more of the impatient run and gun type. This is a game for dreamers. I've used it in my classroom as a teaching tool, and my students always love the experience. Oh. <laughs> I'll put a link to my KSB classroom lab up in the corner. The game first came out almost a decade ago, and it was an instant hit. But just this week, KSB2 was announced at Gamescom, and it came as a total surprise to the community. So they released this trailer, and right now we're gonna watch it together, and as it's rolling, I'll commentate, I'll tell you what I'm excited about, and I'll basically tell you everything we know and that you need to know in preparation for the game. All right, so this trailer is set to M83 outro. That's the name of the song. It's actually really fitting, it's a, it's a good tune. And this trailer is not gameplay footage, it is just, you know, computer rendering. I will, however, after this trailer, show you some pre-alpha gameplay footage. Here's to hoping that over the last seven, eight years or whatever, since the first one released, that the graphics have gotten a lot better. I would assume that they have. This, this, this is being made for um, uh, better PCs and you know Xbox One and PlayStation 4 eventually. But uh, yeah, it, it looks really, really sweet. It's, it's, I'm very excited for this, it's crazy. Um, and KSP2 is a sequel to KSP1. It will take place in the same Kerbal solar system, but what's exciting is that now you can move on into interstellar space beyond the solar system into other solar systems. So this is where you know it's a Kerbal game. There he goes. <laughs> the best part is that the uh, lunar lander there falls on him. <laughs> Look at him sulk. He's sulking, walking in defeat. Yeah, that's funny. So yeah, I'm sure you guys have seen the trailer, but if you haven't yet, you need to watch it. So I noticed the uh, launch tower there. Uh, that's something new to me. I don't know if, there, I mean, if anyone has ever made mods to build your own launch towers before, but that's really cool. That will get that. And there she goes, some sort of Saturn V on steroids. Very cool, exciting. Got a bunch of new technology. Everything's grounded in reality or what could be uh, real. There's no you know, time warp drives though or anything like that. We got new engines, nuclear power engines. Yeah, new kind of fuel tanks. Uh, dude, this is this is. I know it's not gameplay footage, but this is just absolutely beautiful. I think that's a type of nuclear engine that was going on there. And uh, yeah, you got rings and planets with rings. But what you might have noticed already is that there are colonies. You can build colonies now, like just right there. Uh, and they are, you can destroy them too. They can break and fall apart and blow up. That's what I'm really excited about because I've always struggled. And look at their, look at their new haircuts, more customization options. I love their new spacesuits. It's awesome. They turn them different colors maybe. It, it's like they took a lot of mods that were developed for the first one, took a lot of those ideas and implemented it into this one. Now it's not the same developers. Uh, Squad out of Mexico built the first game and uh, I, Oh, litho breaking near you in 2020. Yes. <laughs> if you don't understand the joke of litho breaking near you, uh, just look up the lithosphere and you'll you'll get it right away. Yeah, you can build colonies now, which is very helpful to me because I've never made it past you know Duna really. I mean, I've put satellites past that, but I never landed a Kerbal on any planet past Duna, which is like Mars. And it's just because you know it's time consuming because I like playing career mode. I don't play any other mode but career mode, and. Um, and I don't like, you know, starting over if I kill a Kerbal, I like him to be, you know, permanently dead. So I think b being able to build a colony for KSP2 will be helpful because you'll be able to build a colony, say on Duna, which means it'll be easier to build new rockets on those colonies and then, you know, go to another planet that would otherwise be too challenging, too far away for people like me. <laughs> so they are extending the mod system. So it's more involved and, and people can mod easier than the first one. There are more landscapes as well. It releases in the spring of 2020 for PC, so before the end of March, and then sometime later it will be released for consoles. I'm going to continue to research and follow along with the development of KSP2, and I'll put everything that I learned on my new website that should be launching here in the next week or two. So that's it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until the next one, Godspeed.
Big shout out and thank you to all my Cloud Licking patrons. If it wasn't for them, this show would not be what it is today. And if you enjoy watching these videos, please consider becoming a patron yourself. For as little as $1, you can get access to more Cloud Licking content. There's a link in the description. And hey, while you're at it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell so you never miss an episode, and give this video a like. God bless you.